वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So this begins a new chapter, chapter 37, the killing of Keshi and Vyoma from the tenth canto. Shri Sukha Uvacha. Keli tu kamsa prahita kuram. Keli tu kamsa prahita kuramahim. Keshi tu kamsa prahita kuramahim. Maha hao nirjarayan manojwaraha. Sata Vaduta Bra Vimana Sakulam Kurvana Bo Hisita Bisita Kilaha Sri Sukha Ovacha Kesi tu kamsa prahita kuramahim. Maha hayo nirajaran manojwaraha. Satta vaduta brahvimana sakulam. Kurvanna bohi sita, pisita kilaha. Sri Sukha Uvacha, Kesi tu kamsa prahita kuramahim. Mahahayo nirjarayan manojwaraha. Sata vaduta brahvimana sakulam. Kurvanna bohisita pisita kilaha. Sri Sukha Uvacha, Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, Keshi, the demon named Keshi, to 
and then Kamsa Prahita, sent by Kamsa, Kurai, with his hooves, Mahim, the earth, Mahahaya, a huge horse, Nirjarayan, ripping apart, Mana, like that of the mind, Chwaraha, whose speed, Sata, by the hairs of his mane, Avaduta, scattered, Abra, with the clouds, <coughs> Vimana, and the airplanes of the demigods, Sakulam, crowded, Kurvan, making, Naba, the sky, Hesita, by his neighing, Bisita, frightened, Akila, everyone, Tam, him, Trisayatam, terrifying, Bhagavan, the Supreme Lord, Swagokulam, his cowherd village, Tathesitai, by that neighing, Vala, by the hairs of his tail, Vigornita, shaken, Ambudam, the clouds, Atmanam, himself, Ajo, for a fight, Mrigayatam, searching after, Agrani, coming forward, Upavayat, called out, Sa, he, Kesi, Vyanadan, roared, Migendravat, like a lion. This is two verses, verses one and two. Sukadev Goswami said, the demon Kesi, sent by Kamsa, appeared in Vraj as a great horse. Running with the speed of the mind, he tore up the earth with his hooves. The hairs on his mane scatter the clouds and the demigods airplanes throughout the sky. And he terrified everyone present with his loud neighing. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead saw how the demon was frightening his village of Gokul by neighing terribly and shaking the clouds with his tail, the Lord came forward to meet him. Kesi was searching for Krishna to fight. So when the Lord stood before him and challenged him to approach, the, Lord res the horse responded by roaring like a lion. No purport, verse number three. Seeing the Lord standing before him, Kesi ran towards him in extreme rage, his mouth gaping as if to swallow up the sky. Rushing with furious speeds, the unconquerable and unapproachable horse demon tried to strike the lotus-eyed lord with his two front legs. But the transcendental lord dodged Casey's blow and then with his arms angrily seized the demon by his legs, whirled him around in the air and contemptuously threw him the distance of 100 bow lengths just as Garuda might throw a snake. Then Lord Krishna stood there. Upon regaining consciousness, Kesi angrily got up, opened his mouth wide, and again rushed to attack Lord Krishna. But the Lord just smiled and thrust his left arm into the horse's mouth as easily as one would make a snake enter a hole in the ground. Next six, Casey's teeth immediately fell out when they touched the Supreme Lord's arm, which to the demon felt as hot as molten iron. When Casey's body 
I'm sorry, within Keshi's body, the Supreme Personality of Garhat's arm then expanded greatly like a diseased stomach swelling because of neglect. Mm. Interesting description here. I, I hope you got the picture. <laughs> this is a two-line purport by the devotees of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur points out that although Lord Krishna's arm is more tender and cooling than a blue lotus, to Keshi it felt extremely hot, as if making of lightning bolts. <clears throat> Om Agyan Timirandasya Gina Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Bande Ham Shigaro Shi Uta Padegamalam Shigarun Vaishnavamscha Shi Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Padijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Rishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bhyebhacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nittananda Siya Dvaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaura Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So sometimes when Krishna kills a demon he really goes through a lot of dramatic preparations and acting just to make it exciting. And sometimes he doesn't have any time, so he just finishes the demon off. <laughs> yeah. Or he just doesn't want to be bothered with all this extra stuff. So in this case, Keshi didn't have much of a chance. <laughs> Anyone who approaches the Lord, will always receive the best possible mercy. For Keshi, being in the mood of a demon, that mercy comes by uh, eliminating his demoniac mentality. So that's the Lord's mercy. Krishna is samoham sabhabhute shuna me dvesustina priya. He's equal. It's hard for the conditioned soul to actually understand the equality of the Lord because in this world there is so much apparent inequality. Mm -hmm. So based on what we perceive and what we experience, uh, when we hear how God is equal, we can only understand through philosophy. Here we see that the, the demon his, when we say mercy, was that he became freed from his demoniac mentality. And he also, being killed by the Lord, obviously got a very high position. So these demons who are sent by Kamsan are very, we might say they're very blessed demons. <laughs> There's some demons that don't get killed don't get killed by the Lord, but kill, can make, be killed by the Lord through the material energy. But those who get directly killed by the Lord have, they get special mercy. So that's the Lord's kindness. <laughs> and here, it was quite easy for the Lord to dispatch this demon to the abode of Yamaraj. And he simply 
you know, thrust his arm, which says here, the Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says it was cooling like a blue lotus. Uh, we can imagine only what a, how cooling a lotus flower is. And it's simply when one sees the lotus flower, one feels the mind becomes pacified, the mind becomes cool and free from what we say, a lot of extra noise, the mind becomes somewhat pacified. And here, that arm is tender and cooling as a blue lotus. But Keshi perceived it quite the opposite. It was extremely hot, <laughs> as if made from lightning bolts, not just one, but many bolts. <laughs> and so the Lord's body is transcendental and therefore it acts according to his transcendental will. He's not, what we say, a, affected by what we say material calculations of a, a body. Uh, material bodies have limited capacity and limited use, but Krishna's body is transcendental in all cases. One of the limbs or all of the limbs can take part in using the functions of all the other parts of the body. So for Krishna, uh, if he wants to make his cool arm hot, that's easy. <laughs> and the arm, we might even say, didn't become hot, but it was felt hot by Keshi. Yayatam pram pampadyante tam sataiva bhajamiyaham mama vartmanam vartante manusya parta sarvasyaha. As one approaches the Lord, the Lord reciprocates according to that approach. So, so Keshi got exactly what he was destined to get by how he approached the Lord. If you approach the Lord in love and devotion, the Lord reciprocates in that way. And one approaches the Lord in any other way, the Lord will reciprocate accordingly just to satisfy the recipient. That's Krishna's mercy. So for Keshi, he got the extreme mercy of the Lord and was killed by the Lord. Very nice description. Today is the appearance day of Sri Advaita Acharya, who is none different than the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Mahavishnu. So I would like to, with the blessings of the devotees and Srila Prabhupada, try to say something in regard to this, when we say, very glorious personality who was very instrumental in bringing the appearance of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the world. Who is Advaita Charya? He's actually described in Chaitanya Charitamrita as a element or he is actually Mahavishnu. But Mahavishnu manifests himself in two aspects of himself. One is called the efficient cause it's explained that Krishna expands into Sri Balaram. And Balaram expands into the, what is called the Chaturvyuha, Vasudev, Sankarsana, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha. And that Sankarsana expands himself into Lord Narayan. Lord Narayan again continues with the expansion and the second chapter of Yuha manifests himself. Although all these aspects of the Supreme Lord are eternal, we understand that through the process of what we say hierarchy within the spiritual realm, it appears that they are expanding one after another. Although all are expand all are eternal. So for the sake of understanding hierarchy, at least spiritual hierarchy, we can understand this mood of expansion.
from Sankarshan, the second Sankarshan Mahavishnu comes and that begins the, the creation of the material world. The ingredients to make up the material world is called Pradhan. That is the, the Lord creates the elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego in their aggregate state of existence. They're not functioning, they're simply in a dormant condition. And that two aspects of Mahavishnu is that he expands himself into the efficient cause, which is the ingredients of the material energy, and then he activates that same uh, ingredients through what is called Sri Advaita Charya. He is the, the material cause, or the cause that activates the Pradhan and brings about the formation of the material energy into the manifestations of the different forms which expand ultimately into Garbhodakshai Vishnu and then uh, Lord Brahma comes and takes everything. So Sri the Chaitanya Charitamrita describes his position. He is the Supreme Personality of God. He is the active force within the material energy, which gives the material energy life, like that. And also, he sometimes explained as being the force that makes Maya move, <laughs> like that. So this is all described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita in the fifth chapter of uh, Adi Lila. So that same Advaita Acharya. Oh, appears in this material world in order to bring about and to assist Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his transcendental pastimes. Sri Advaita Acharya is um, also, sometimes he has said he is a combination of Sadashiva and Mahavishnu also. In other places in the Shastras it mentions that when Mahavishnu glances over the Pradhan, that glance is Sadashiva. So there is the connection with the Sri Advaita Acharya. So we find that in the element of creation there is a very intricate and elaborate systematic organization how everything manifests itself like that there's no such thing as chaos <laughs> the material scientists like to describe you know creation in, by explaining it in a form of chaos <laughs> because to be very much respectful to the scientists, but to give them their proper um, definition is that because they cannot figure it out, it's chaos. <laughs> when something is not understandable, one can assume it happens just by chance or chaos like that. So it's simply an assumption based on not, not knowing the actual understanding. But we see, we hear from Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita how everything is nicely, systematically coming down to our level of existence. It's all orchestrated by the Lord in his various manifestations of himself where Sri Advaita Charya is a very intricate part to the, of that manifestation. Uh, Sri Advaita Acharya, as the personality who appeared in this world, appeared in 1434, which was practically 52 years before the appearance of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, he was a Brahmana. He appeared in a place called Shantipur. Um, and we don't have too much information, at least available in the available scriptures that we have about his early life. <laughs> but we know that he was very much respected within the Brahmin community and was considered in many cases as the leader of the Brahmin community. 
and therefore in, in, in that sense that he was considered to be a teacher. <laughs> in fact, actually, he is called a Dvaita because he is non-dual. That means he's not different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. And at the same time, he's called Acharya, and the scriptures say Acharya simply means teacher, or one who teaches the eternal principles of devotional service, like that. He is both the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and also, he also plays the role of a devotee. His playing the role of a devotee is his own transcendental pastimes, because it is explained that the Lord, Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda, and Sri Advaita find more satisfaction, happiness in playing the role of a devotee of the Lord than actually being in the role of the Lord. <laughs> this is an interesting point because it's fundamental to the process of devotional service and to the element of satisfaction that to become a devotee is so glorious that even the Supreme Lord leaves his position or what we say accepts another position as the role in the servitor just to serve himself in his different manifestations as a pure devotee of the Lord. So how glorious it is to become a devotee. <laughs> Sometimes we think devotee means one who is servant and servant is one who is considered to be in the lower aspect. Master is always considered to be higher, but actually uh, one becomes, what we say, satisfied and happy simply by serving because to become the servant of the great is as glorious as being the great itself, it says. And one who is serving the great, actually, it says that even enjoys on the same level as the master. Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam, Shikshastikam, the first verse, it says that there's an unlimited ocean of transcendental happiness that comes by the execution of the pure devotional service to the Lord. Although the jiva is limited, the jiva's ability to experience happiness appears or is, is described as unlimited. In relationship to the unlimited, the, the limited also becomes unlimited in the element of, of joy and happiness. So, and of course, there is another reason which is very and really fundamental to the whole pastime of Lord Chaitanya's appearance is that if Advaita Charya, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda appeared as the Supreme Personality of God and in this world, that would only increase Sahajism, um, the idea that I am the Supreme Lord, the Mayavadi understanding that, ever, that all living beings are God or have forgotten. That's why when Lord Chaitanya was approached or addressed he would very much reject the idea or hold block his ears when he was called the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because others would take advantage of that and say, yes, this is true. The living entity is actually God in the material world. Like that. So this is a very, also a very important part of their role as a devotee of the Lord in order to destroy this idea that the living entity the jiva is the supreme, like that. So Advaita Acharya, we hear that the Lord appeared for six transcendental reasons, three internally for his own satisfaction and three externally in order to enact religious principles. His one was, of course, to bring the Yuga Dharma, Harinam Sankirtan to the world Krishna Varnam Tvasa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshadam Yagnai Sankirtana Praya Yajanti Hi Sumeda Saha. The chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, the Lord appeared in order to, in, 
to inspire and to teach both the process of pure devotional service in the form of glorification of the Supreme Lord by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And of course, to destroy or to eliminate demoniac mentality and establish religious principles as he describes himself in the Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter. And also, as we are here relevant today in today's uh, particular glorification of Advaita Acharya to satisfy and to respond to the call of Sri Advaita Acharya who wanted the Lord to come into this material world and to enact his, spirit, his pastimes. It's described that in Sri Nabadvipa at that time, many persons were, so, were very much educated in various aspects of material and spiritual uh, subject matters, but very few actually took to the process of pure devotional service. And people were worshiping various types of demigods in order to get material benedictions. And it actually extended itself in so much that even people were performing various types of smaller ceremonies in order to bring about auspiciousness on all levels. But not, not much in devotional service. Sri Advaita Acharya, being a pure devotee of the Lord and also the Supreme Lord himself, was feeling unhappy seeing the present condition within the area of Sri Navadvipa at that time. And it is explained that he sometimes would become extremely unhappy seeing the pretentiousness of the, the, spirit, the persons in their spiritual practice. And sometimes it even would relegate down to having marriages between cats and dogs, that's mentioned, also in Chaitanya Bhagavat. So, we can see that even at that time, there was a lot of materialism in the name of spirituality, or what we say, Sahajism, impersonalism, worship of demigods, various manifestations of forms of worship concocted by the living entity are derived from the scriptures in order to achieve material benedictions. So Advaita Acharya, he also has the element of Shiva and Shiva gets angry. <laughs> uh, he gets angry sometimes, he, the whole universe shakes. So his, he would, would sometimes control his anger and at the same time pray to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that prayer was orchestrated in a very beautiful way as is described in the Shastras. He would go to the banks of the, the Ganges and with tulsi leaves and with beautiful flowers, with chandan, and he would uh, worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the form of the Shalagran Shila, praying, crying, not only praying, but crying out for the Lord to appear in order to bring about true religious principles into the world. This is the compassion of a Vaishnava. This is a very important element of this whole pastime that in the role of a Vaishnava, a Vaishnava is compassionate seeing the suffering conditions of the conditioned souls. Even though this, the conditioned souls don't see themselves as suffering, although they are, still one who has knowledge and one who has devotion can see people are wasting their lives simply in material pursuits. So Advaita Acharya, in a mood of compassion and deep compassion, called out to the Lord in his prayers while he was worshiping the Lord in the form of the Shalagram Shila. We also see that in the life of Srila Prabhupada. Actually, <clears throat> to go back a little bit, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he, in his early days, as a young man, he was engaged in a dramatic play, playing the part of Advaita Acharya. 
it's described, Prabhupada talks about this, and how in that dramatic performance he played the part so well with such what we say empathy uh, in executing the mood of Advaita Acharya that uh, it describes the audience were in tears <laughs> just seeing his divine grace play the part of Advaita Acharya <laughs> and it's very interesting because Advaita Acharya is the person who called Lord Chaitanya to come to this world in the mood of compassion and concern for the conditioned souls. So Srila Prabhupada also brought Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the entire world by his pure devotion and by his dedication to spreading the, the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu around the world and establishing the Harinam Sankirtan movement. So we can say that uh, exhibiting the deep mood of Sri Advaita Acharya, Srila Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness around the world. And so after some time, um, the Lord responded to the prayers of Advaita. Of course, there are many elements that come together all at once to bring about the Lord's descent into this material world. But we hear how it was the calling of Dwaita Acharya that brought about the Lord's appearance at that particular time. Uh, Dwaita Acharya is Bhakta avatar. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhaktivindam What is that verse? Uh -huh. Panchatattva Makam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Sarupakam Bhakta Avatar Bhakti Akyam Namami Bhakti Shakti Kam Describing the personality and their particular element of identity within the Panchatattva, he is Bhakta Avatar. That means he is the supreme element of Bhakti. He has appeared as the devotee of the Lord, but a, 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 as a supreme Lord, but acting in the role of a devotee of the Lord. Yeah. There's one very beautiful, beautiful uh, sloka from that pa, uh, that particular chapter describing Sri Advaita is that he says, he's expressing his heart. He says, I am a devotee of Lord Chaitanya. I am a devotee of Lord Chaitanya. I am a devotee of Lord Chaitanya. I am a devotee of the servants of Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> Again, expressing the mood of a devotee. Of course, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wasn't so happy to be worshipped by Advaita Acharya. In fact, following the etiquette and being in the role of a devotee, Lord Chaitanya would see Advaita as his superior. But Advaita Acharya didn't want to be in that role. But Lord Chaitanya wanted to worship him in that way. And so Advaita he did something which is somewhat revolutionary, or might we say unconventional, something that should not be copied. <laughs> this, is not in a, this is not in the role of the Supreme Lord. He's acting, but at the same time, he's not acting in the mood of a, an example. Because of his strong desire to be, to worship the Lord and not be worshipped by Lord Chaitanya, he decided to somehow or other get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya in a different way. And so it's described that he decided to associate with and hear uh, karmakanda or that kind of philosophy that teaches that ultimately karma and jnana 
is equal to or superior than bhakti, <laughs> like that. Of course, we know according to Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yoginam apisar vesham magatendra natmanaha stradavan bhajate yo mamte me yukta tamo mataha. Krishna says, the bhakti yogi is the highest of all yogis. There are many different types of yogis who practice elevation on different levels, detaching oneself from the activities of material world by offering the results and devotion to the Lord, cultivating transcendental knowledge, performing austerities, and uh, understanding the difference between what is eternal and what is temporary. The jnana yogis, through various austerities and pranayam, ultimately coming to the understanding that, you know, that the, the, the living entity is eternal and not this material body. But these are all aspects of the Supreme Absolute Truth, but not the complete. And one, unless one comes to the pure devotional service, that I am the eternal Krishna, the servant of Krishna, Jivair Sarubhai Krishna and Nitya Das, Ekala Isha Krishna Asa Brita, and that there's only one Supreme Lord, and He is worthy of everyone's service and devotion. That is the ultimate principle. So Advaita Charya, not wanting to be worshipped, but wanting to be offered to be a, in the mood of a servant to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he decided to get the Lord a little bit concerned. <laughs> so he went out and was hearing about Gyan, Karma, like that, as being equal to Bhakti from various other speakers. When the word got back to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Lord became very concerned. <laughs> he became very concerned, extremely concerned, <laughs> that this is a very, very bad example. <laughs> and at the same time, he wanted to correct it. So it's described that one day when Advaita Acharya was in Shantipur, uh, Lord Chaitanya said to Lord Nityananda, let's go visit Advaita, they left Navadweep. There's a little small pastime in between on their way to see Advaita in Shantipur, where they stopped along the banks of the Ganga, they were traveling towards Shantipur, and they noticed a little hermitage on the way. Lord Chaitanya said to Lord Nityananda, who lives in that little hermitage? Nityananda said, oh, I think there's a sannyasi, he lives there. Oh, Lord Chaitanya said, let's go see. It's, let's get the blessings of a sannyasi. <laughs> so they went in and there was this elderly man and he welcomed them. They sat down. Lord Chaitanya was eager to hear or get some blessings from a sannyasi. That is in the role of a devotee, one is always eager to get blessings. Of course, one should go in the right place for blessings. Not that Lord Chaitanya went in the wrong place, but Lord Nityananda said, this is a sannyasi. In those days, sannyasis were glorified as being able to give blessings and benedictions. So, they sat there for some time and thinking to ask the sannyasi a question, Lord Chaitanya said, what actually is the goal of life? Wanting to hear from the sannyasi. And the sannyasi, of course, wasn't, we can actually say that he wasn't really knowledgeable or in the proper dress. And so he started to speak according to his material consciousness. And he started to say that the goal of life actually is to enjoy as much as possible. <laughs> Of course, enjoyment is there, but not in the way, and not in that way. That enjoyment is based on service to the Supreme and not through contact with the senses and their objects. As described in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that's another way to suffer, that's all. And so, when Lord Chaitanya heard his response, he said, actually, the, the goal of life is to glorify the Lord and to chant his name. 
The sannyasi, being senior in age, became very disturbed by Lord Chaitanya's response and started to say, just see, this is the indication of Kali Yuga. <laughs> that babes who are just appearing from the wombs of their mother, they're instructing us who are well-versed in knowledge and have experience. <laughs> Something like that, anyway. He was quite proud of his situation. And therefore, Lord Nityananda could see that there was going to be a little conflict here, so he said, let's just have some prasad. <laughs> so the sannyasi said, oh, okay, yes, you are my guest. And so he went and he called his wife. <laughs> he, he, was a, he was a grihasta sannyasi. So, let's see. I think that's an oxymoron, but I'm... <laughs> He's a grahastra sannyasi. And he brought, his wife came out with some foodstuffs. So Lord Chaitanya actually said, actually today I am fasting, you know, just give me a little bit of fruit, and that would be fine. No, he said, you're actually my guest, please take prasadam. The Lord said, no, no, just bring a little fruit. I just want to have something simple. And then the sannyasi said, well, would you like some bliss? <laughs> Haribo, bliss. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that word gets many definitions attached to it. <laughs> so his understanding of bliss was, and Lord Chaitanya looked at Lord Nityananda and says, what does he mean by bliss? And Lord Nityananda said, I think he wants to give you some wine. <laughs> so Lord Lord Chaitanya looked at Lord Nityananda, they looked at each other, and they decided it was time to go. <laughs> so they ran out the door and jumped in the Ganga to get a little purification. Of course, teaching that, uh, you know, such association is contaminating. So after, after some time, they continued on their way, and they arrived at Shantipur. And, and Lord, Lord Advaita Charya was there, with his concert, Sita Takarani. He was sitting in his courtyard, and along was Hari Das Thakur was also there. And as soon as Lord Chaitanya appeared, and he saw Advaita Acharya, he remembered why he came. <laughs> and he started to go directly towards Advaita in a very angry mood. He came to Advaita and he started to beat him <laughs> quite regularly. Tak Sita Takarani was aghast. She was shocked. She said, he's an old man. You're going to kill him. Lord Chaitanya didn't hear that. <laughs> he kept beating him. Advaita was loving it. He was thinking, now I get the, now I get the position of being the servant. Haridas Thakur was laughing. <laughs> He thought it was quite humorous, he understood. And finally the Lord stopped and he said, Atwaita, how could you do this? You know how much I've, I've come to this world to teach eternal religious principles and to destroy this Mayavadi and materialistic understanding. And you're acting the, exactly that way. He was, he was, he was say just like when you you you're astonished when somebody does something that you can't understand how why they're doing it and you're still concerned for them and you're expressing your love but at the same time it's mixed with astonishment that was lord chaitanya's mood and Adwaita just smiled and of course he felt now i have attain the mercy of the Lord. So this is very instrumental, or very, in, in what we say, essential to understand that the devotee always wants to be in the mood of a servant. The Mayavadi philosophy is that you can become the master. And if you're the master, then you're the controller. If you're the controller, you're the, the enjoyer. And if you're the enjoyer, that's the goal. But Bhaktaram Yagya Tapasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram Suhidam Sarvabhutanam Shantambam Yantam Brichtati that actually there is 
Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and all his manifestations is the only enjoyer. And he enjoys his transcendental pastimes both in the spiritual world and when he manifests these pastimes in the material world, he invites the conditioned souls to take part in his, these pastimes and also to experience real enjoyment, not this ephemeral enjoyment that has come by way of this material world. Advaita Acharya saw Srila Haridas Thakur as the greatest of all Vaishnavas. He was Namacharya. Srila Haridas Thakur would chant the holy names of the Lord practically 24 hours a day, but for the sake of numbers he would count three lakhs of names, 333,333 in mentions in one place. He chanted that many names. Advaita Charya, being the head of the Brahmanas, would sometimes perform the strata ceremony. And in that ceremony, he would be officiate and would offer the sacred what we say, remnants of that ceremony to the most qualified of all, brahmanas. So he did something revolutionary. Of course, according to tradition, it was revolutionary. He awarded the sacred patra, or the first remnants, to Srila Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur was, what we say, astonished, you could say. He was not feeling fit to be accepted in that way, and he was also wondering, this will be a spot on the reputation of Sri Adaita Acharya, because we know Haridas Thakur was born in a very obscure family, a Muslim family. He was not considered within the, the Hindu caste, and therefore he was considered to be an outcast. But Lord Chaitanya saw him as the best of all devotees because he was always chanting the holy names of the Lord and always preaching the glories of the Lord. Sri Advaita Acharya recognized Srila Haridas Thakur in that way and awarded him the Patra, the first remnants, or the person who is glorified as the best of all brahmanas. So he understood like that. Even Srila Prabhupada, we see, when Prabhupada took Krishna consciousness to the Western world, he was criticized for bringing uh, pure, eternal religious teachings to the world of the Malachas, <laughs> uh, the Western countries. Prabhupada was criticized and sometimes even, you know, very heavily criticized for doing that by the smarta brahmanas, by others. And, but Prabhupada understood Lord Chaitanya's mood. There's that statement within the Shastras that Lord Chaitanya's mood would be every town and village. His, his movement would spread to every town and village. And some people mistakenly, or not, may, may, we might say mistakenly, but without complete understanding of the, the purport of that scripture, was understood it as every town and village in the, in the land of India. So when Prabhupada went outside of India to bring uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement, it was considered a, uh, a deviation. But Prabhupada didn't care, because <laughs> he knew <laughs> what Lord Chaitanya wanted. He knew this was the instructions of his spiritual master. And so he would, he would accept criticism simply to follow eternal religious principles. Uh, that's just the way it is in Kali Yuga. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, <laughs> people will find fault with you. And even prestigious people will find fault. People who have some position, who have some, some facilities in life, because people don't understand, you know, the heart of a Vaishnava. The heart of a Vaishnava can only be understood by someone who has that same heart. <laughs> and so Prabhupada's mood was that he gave the highest 
to the lowest. And that example is there in Chaitanya Charitamrita, or we might say in Chaitanya Bhagwat, when Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda uh, and Haridas Thakur gave the highest to Jagai and Marai, who were completely disqualified by all definitions of disqualification. <laughs> they had no qualification. But this is Lord Chaitanya. He wants to bring his movement or his compassion to the most fallen. And Advaita Chari is, is an, an example of that compassion to the fallen conditioned souls as he glorified Srila Haridas Thakur amongst everyone like that. Although Haridas wasn't fallen, but still he was seen as an outcast like that. One Advaita Chari had one assistant, Kamala, what was his name, Kamala, huh? Kamala Kanta Vishwas, yes, who one time wrote a note, and he wrote on the note something that Lord Chaitanya didn't like at all. He wrote this note and said that Sri Advaita Acharya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but he has a debt of 300 rupees to the king. <laughs> we might say another oxymoron. <laughs> Two things that don't go together. You know what an oxymoron is? It's like business ethics and happy marriage. <laughs> these and these are called oxymorons. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> two things that don't go together. <laughs> but uh, so when Lord Chaitanya read that, he was a little concerned. He said, How is this? I don't know the word he used describing Kamalaka, Kamalaka Vishwasas. But he said, how can he speak and say that Advaita Charya, of course, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but he's made him a debtor. He has a debt. How can the Supreme Lord have a debt? <laughs> and so um, this was very intolerable. And uh, the Lord Chaitanya, that was corrected, and of course, when he, the word got back to Advaita Acharya, he corrected his servant. Like that. So, we see how it's easy to deviate. Another wonderful pastime. Of course, there's so many wonderful pastimes of Sri Advaita Acharya. He was one of the first persons to find out that Lord Chaitanya would, was actually going to take sannyas. He actually was staying in, in uh, Shantipur at the time, and uh, there was a voice that appeared from the sky saying that Lord Chaitanya would soon leave and take the renounced order of life. When he heard that, he was thinking, how is this possible? The Supreme Lord would be in a mood of renunciation and live like a simple, poor sannyasi. It was intolerable for all the devotees, especially Advaita. When Advaita heard that, he became totally unhappy and decided to end his life. So he decided, he said, I don't know about the rest of you, he said to the devotees, but I'm going to drown myself in the Ganga. They all said, we're going with you. <laughs> and then the, a voice came from the sky and said, actually, don't do it. Lord Chaitanya will be with you very soon. Please be patient, please be patient. So they, they waited, of course. So Advaita's love for the Supreme Lord, like that. Everyone felt the same love when Lord Chaitanya decided to take sannyas. 
how is it possible that he could accept the role of a mendicant? They knew he was the Supreme Lord, but he was playing the role of a devotee, but to show compassion to the fallen conditioned souls and to reach others with this message who could not be reached by any other, anything else by a sannyasi, especially the Mayavadis. Lord Chaitanya converted 60,000 Mayavadis. He could only do that in the role of a sannyasi. Well, that was one of the main reasons he took sannyas was to convert those who were in different categories of material life and to reach them with this the message of the holy name of the Lord. It's a very wonderful, instructive pastime that is very difficult to understand, but that is to understand Lord Chaitanya's mood in this particular pastime. But during the Mahaprakash Leela, Jai Sisi Radha Gopinath Chi Ki During the Mahaprakash Leela, when uh, the Lord was giving out benedictions and blessings to his devotees, he was freely offering whatever they wanted just for the sake of request. Just, he said, just ask me and I'll he was in such a magnanimous mood. He was in the mood of the Supreme Lord, giving out blessings, benedictions to anyone and everyone. That's a long pastime. That was for 21 hours. During that time, a request was made to give Mother Sachi Devi, his glorious mother, pure devotional service. When Lord Chaitanya heard that, he became silent. And then he spoke. He said, my mother, she's an offender. <laughs> of course, that shocked everyone. How could the mother of the Supreme Lord, Lord Chaitanya's mother, she is considered the mother of all, every, all mothers. She is the mother of the mothers. She's glorious as a mother and she is glorious as a great devotee of the Lord. She is a Nitya Siddha. But Lord Chaitanya said, actually my mother's an offender. Then he explained that actually she committed an offense against the Dvaita Acharya. And then he said, when my older brother Vishwarup was visiting a Dvaita Acharya regularly and hearing from him, Vishwarup became infused with the mood of renunciation and gave up all attachments to all other activities and left home and took sannyas and was never seen again. This broke the heart of my mother and I was the only son left so I stayed with my mother. But then after some time I was also inspired to hear from Advaita. And then my mother was thinking, oh, now my other son, he is also going to be influenced by this Advaita. Therefore, this Advaita, he is supposed to be Advaita, but he is not actually, he is not Advaita, he is dual. He's, he's not one, he's two. He has another mood. He is non-Advaita, not Advaita. And so, she didn't say it. She just thought of it. It was out of her motherly love she thought like this. But Lord Chaitanya wanted to teach that one should, if, even if one feels a little un, ill feelings towards a Vaishnava, one should not keep that thought in mind because that thought could lead to something greater and more damaging in one's spiritual life. Even negative thoughts, although they don't count as offenses, and that is the concession of Kali Yuga, because Kali Yuga is so bad, that to think negatively, one doesn't get a reaction for that. But it can lead, and many times it will lead, to words, and actions which cause great, great havoc on one's spiritual life. So Lord Chaitanya said, my mother is an offender. 
And the only way she can get free from that offense is she takes the dust of the lotus feet of Advaita Charya and places it on her head. Advaita Charya was thinking, Mother Sachi put my foot dust on her head? No. <laughs> he didn't like it at all. Because he was also there, he heard. So, later on, a kirtan began, and the kirtan was very ecstatic, and the devotees were dancing, and Advaita Acharya went into ecstasy and fell unconscious. At that time, Lord Chaitanya looked at his mother and gave the signal, here's your chance. <laughs> so she took the opportunity and grabbed the foot dust of Lord Advaita and placed it on her head like that. And Lord Chaitanya was pleased like that. So, like that, Lord Chaitanya wanted to teach. So, there are many, many wonderful pastimes. Um, today is a fast day, of course. We're fasting on today to, in honor of this appearance of this great soul. So, I don't know how much time I have. But we can. I'll just mention that during the Rathayatra ceremony, when Lord Chaitanya divided the groups of dancers during the Rath, during the Lord, during the Rathayatra, into seven different groups, Advaita Charya. He was about 125 years old at the time. He was, he was over 100 years old, and he was the lead dancer. <laughs> so he was dancing. Haridas Thakur also was quite elderly. He was also one of the lead dancers. They both were el older than Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This was towards the end of Lord Chaitanya's stay. So he became one of the lead dancers. <clears throat> so today is a very special day. I'm sure tonight there'll be more kata on Sri Advaita Acharya. So I'll stop here, but I'll just mention one thing which, I, which came to mind, which is something that is very dear to me, that on this day, eight years ago, uh, one very, very illustrious and very, very wonderful brahmachari from Radhagopinath disappeared on this day. Do you remember his name? Cowherd boy, Stoka Krishna Prabhu. He got the, the benediction or mercy of leaving on the, the appearance of Sri Advaita Acharya. Everyone remembers Toka Krishna for his simplicity, his humility, and his enthusiasm to serve, and his complete unpretentious nature. So simple, so humble, so dedicated, so enthusiastic. And obviously he pleased the Lord in so many ways that the Lord decided to end his material existence. <clears throat> and take him back to the spiritual world. So today is the, we can also remember this wonderful devotee who graced Radha Gopinath temple with his service <clears throat> and his inspiration. Personally, <clears throat> he was one of my friends. I never saw him as somebody in a lesser position. I saw him, he was a personal friend. He would come and see me, he would bring me gifts and we would talk. Of course, he was very, very humble so he wouldn't speak so much, but he was always enthusiastic to serve and to somehow please the devotees. So today is also an extra special element of today's uh, celebration, the disappearance of Stoka Krishna Prabhu. So thank you very much. Sri Advaita Acharya Ki, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Nitai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.